James wants to do that for some reason on the camera. Hello, my name is Martin. Welcome back to another video. It's a cold February day, and we're going to take a look at one of John's gems. John's just there. He's brought us to another one of his little gems. Where have you gone? There he is. Um, it's a church, St. Thomas of Beckett Church in Hepton Stall in Yorkshire. Okay, so where are we this week, and where's Hepton Stall? Let's zoom in on the map. We're not far from places we've been before. One of them is Hebden Bridge. As we zoom in here, there you go. You've got Hebden Bridge there, and just down the road is Hepton Stall. And more importantly, a place called Crag Vale, where we've been before. Um, so that's going to feature in the story in a bit. And if you just go down here, we get into uh, Rochdale, and then before you know it, we're down in the city centre of Manchester. So we're not that far from Manchester. Let's crack on. And it's not that church there. It's even better. I'll yeah. turn the camera around. Look at this. Look at that thing there. As old as the hills, honestly, as old as the hills. So very old church. I've got some dates for you. I've got a little bit of history for you. Fantastic graveyard, but look at this. All the old stones that are covering the ground and some of the dates on the stones are really old so we'll take a look i'll do, give you a walk around the church and then we'll take a look at some of the gravestones what do you reckon it is nice we've not brought a brew so we're trying to find a little tea shop yeah we are this whole entire place is very oldy worldy isn't it's it? what you, you you could turn up and it just turns into pebble stone ground doesn't it yeah like cobbles it is yeah <laughs> <laughs> what he means is very old, oldy worldy. Yeah, yeah right. you turn up and it just it, the houses just change, don't they? Well, it's like we've gone back in time. Yeah. So that's our church there. I got you some, get you some dates on it. Well, let's take a look inside it's got no roof on it at the moment as you can see uh, imagine this church predates and i'll do a slow turn because it's very beautiful here very beautiful indeed i'll do a slow turn but imagine the church i've just shown you was a precursor to that church there so let's take a look inside So here in Heptonstall, you can see how a community has built and rebuilt its parish church and commemorated its dead over a period of 700 years. It's most unusual to find two churches in a single churchyard and few other examples exist in England. The original church dedicated to the martyred Archbishop St Thomas of Becket remained in use until the mid-19th century. But following storm damage in 1847, the decision was taken to raise money to build a replacement. The new church, which is the one I showed you be, uh, originally behind it, uh, is dedicated to St. Thomas the Apostle. It was completed in 1854 at a cost of £6,600. Instead of being demolished, the earlier building was left to become a ruin. Now it's very old this church because it says during the medieval period when England was a Roman Catholic country the church would have been highly decorated with ornate carvings and colourful wall paintings showing stories from the Bible and the lives of the saints. Outside on the east gable of the south nave you can see the original Sanctus bell coat where the, the bell was rung for mass. Yeah, there's a fair bit of ironwork here as well holding it up and even the ironwork that's holding the place up looks quite old. This stuff here, look at that. That's bolted through there. Goes to the outside there. I'll just show you the graveyard. Anyway, who'd have thought it? By the late 1700s, the church had been turned into a great preaching house, dominated by a triple-decker pulpit in the nave. There was seating for 815 people on the ground floor and a further 300 in upper galleries. The church bells and clock summoned people to services, and apparently you can still see traces of the painted clock face on the tower. 
I couldn't see that. Uh, the clock itself made in Sauber Bridge in 1810 is now located in the new church which we've seen behind. And there you go, there's a bit more information for you church aficionados. Look at that, 13th century, that's 1200 nod. And then looking at that tower there, it looks like it was extended, doesn't it, later on. So anyway, there you go, a little bit more information on the church for you there. So we decided we'd take a walk up the street and have a look around the town. And it was very interesting and we found quite a nice, or some nice names and an interesting feature. But we'll come back to Graveyard in a bit. Weaver's Square, it says up there. Top of town, it says up there. Top of town, that says. Nice little feature there, isn't it? Bit of a water pump there. Well, we've got to shine the torch in there and have a look inside there, aren't we? We'll shine the torch in there, definitely. 1891. Yeah, got a date there. 1891, wow. Right, that is cool. And there's a, we can put a torch in there. We've got torches with a look inside. Looks like there's some kind of pump in there. Yeah, like a water pump. Yes, weird. We've got fresh water from. So forgotten pumps. Adam, if you're watching, this is for you. Right, get the torch out of my bag. It's quite useful, James. <laughs> I'm, I'm, is it the big torch you've got? Yeah. Right, got the big torch out. Exploring, Exploring with torch. torches. <laughs> <laughs> right, light it, lad. Light it. Oh, it doesn't go very far, does it? I think it's just water. Right, take a look. Let's take a look. Right, hold it still. Alright, so we've got a bit of water in there. Point it down. Got water, a bit of rubbish. Yeah, uh, come with me around now. How's it going down there? Not much, it stops. Oh, it stops, yeah. Right, so some kind of trough or some kind of, is it a spring maybe? Like a water collection. Yeah, like I reckon it's a spring, right? Possibly, and what you did was, later, because I bet one time you just think you pumped your water from there and it collected it from there. So you, that was actually a pump attached to the, the spring, maybe, what do you reckon? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe a feed somewhere from a little water course or a spring just inside there and then the pump is there you came and got your water for the day. I'm guessing that. What do you reckon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This town. <laughs> he's a bit blown away with it. He likes things. I like things like this, but he's a bit blown away, aren't you? It's just nice, just something to get where we live. It's all modernised, isn't it? And it's nice mm. just to come somewhere. Apart from the cars, yeah. it could be any time at all. If I film this in black and white, there are no cars and no wheelie bins. It could be any time. Looks like the... Uh... Grammar School, 1642 Grammar School. A genuine thing. Oh, kids coming out of church, can't you? And then going in the, uh, going in this door to do Bible class. Found in 1642 by endowment of the Reverend Charles Greenwood, Rector of Thornhill. Lord of the Manor of Heptonstall, rebuilt 1772, closed 1889. So 1772 it dates back to. It's a modest little thing, isn't it? Right, so let's head back to the church and the graveyard because James has got some stuff that he wants to tell you about. So, as you know, have you been watching Happy Valley? So, this was actually filmed there. This is the graveyard of the one, of the main character's partner. She was filmed there, so that's another fact. And then I've got another graveyard for you. Shows. It's a bit of a walk. Right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the camera. And do a fast walk. <coughs> he's going to show us, uh, he's going to show us this other uh, grave. Right, so we're, you brought us over to the newer part of the graveyard, James. What are we looking at? So it's a grave of Sylvia Platt Hughes. I think she's a famous writer or poet. Uh, but it's like you say, it's interesting again because people have been putting pens down, which I find really interesting and cool. So people must appreciate her, her life and everything. Sylvia Plath was an American poet and novelist. She was born in 1932. Anyway, she ended up studying over here in England and here she met her husband, Ted Hughes. 
So apparently Ted Hughes was a poet as well. Now, I'm not an expert here, I'm just reading this up, but it was interesting to see, to hear about or learn about this writer that had never come across before. The relationship with Ted Hughes is apparently an abusive one, and for that reason, when you go to see the grave, you'll notice that the name Hughes has been scrubbed out. Sylvia Plath had been plagued with depression all her life and had numerous suicide attempts. Anyway, however, on the 11th of February 1963, Sylvia was found dead. She'd gassed herself at home. I've only skimmed over this because it would be rude of me to even try and lecture, lecture you on this writer that I know nothing about. I'll leave that to the people that are real fans and are fans of her work. But I just thought I'd mention her seemed as we were in the graveyard. In memory of Mary, the daughter of Abraham Marshall, who departed this life September the 18th, or September, yeah, the 18th, 1814, aged four years. Died July the 19th, 1795. What's that? What? No way. Is that 1738 on that grave? What I try and do is, I try and make links in my mind with the stuff we've done in the past. Um, and when you see these dates where people were dying, 1780 odd, 1822, uh, 1839, I think, wow, these, some of these people were around when Brindley was at Wet Earth Colliery doing his thing, doing his scheme, and when the canals were being built, they were probably worked on the canals, building the bloody things. So it's mind boggling, isn't it? You know, it's absolutely mind boggling. And the longing to know the story, to see it, to get a glimpse of it as it was, you know, we get, we can watch so many things, can't we, on video and films, and we can see old footage of things, but it never extends beyond about a hundred years, does it? Um, <laughs> I, I've got a longer inside me sometimes to see things the way they were, you know, these canals being built and these bridges and these railways, it's incredible. Anyway, coming to a place like this and seeing the ages on the gravestones just brings that back out again. There's a special grave here, isn't there? Yeah. Tell us about it. So, this grave, well, we, when we come, we were walking around and we seen this grave and it had all money on it, didn't it? Yeah. And we was like, why has it got money on it? So obviously we had to look into it and it's about this guy. Pause it. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Googled it and I thought it was his Philip. So we looked into it and it was a guy, a guy who was part of the Crag Vale Coiner group. group. The Crag Vale Coiners, right? So I'm going to have to, we've come off the cuff today. So I'll have to do a little bit of reading <laughs> for you and find out. I do know about, I have heard of him. It's about, um, a, group, a gang that was like making coins, basically. Oh, fake coins. Yeah, fake coins. They were kind of like counterfeiters. So the Cragvale coiners, what were they all about? Well, we went to Cragvale at the back end of last summer, 2022, if you remember, and we did this video here. I don't know if you remember that or not, but Cragvale in a little valley up in, uh, not just outside Hebden Bridge. Anyway, what did the Cragvale coiners do? Well, they were a group of coin counterfeiters. And this is what they did from what I understand. They took genuine coins and they chipped the gold off the sides of the coins, just enough gold off the side of the coins. And then they re-beveled the edges, you know, the little serrated edges. So the coin, the original coin, didn't look much different. They then took the gold that they took off the coin, right? And they took a much cheaper bit of metal. They made a round disc out of it. They had a way of stamping the, 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 the you know, the King's Edel and all the rest of it and they replated it, so it was a much cheaper produced coin. But basically what they then did was, this cheap coin that they remade, they gave it to the local uh, publicans and landlords and it got given out as change in the pubs and it went back into circulation. At the height, in the mid 1700s, there was about 80 people involved in this, so it was quite a gang led by David Hartley, King David as he was known. They were based at Keelan Farm, I think, and Hilltop Farm in the area, 
and David Hartley was based at uh, an old farmhouse called Bell House. So this is the days before uh, the police force and it was difficult initially to work out where these counterfeit coins were coming from because they eventually got out into the general population. Eventually the activity or the production of these coins was tracked up to um, Crag Vale. Now I'll have to read this next bit. So in 1769, William Dayton, a public official, investigated the possibilities of a counterfeiting gang in Crag Vale. A coiner by the name of James Broadbent betrayed the gang and turned King's evidence. He revealed the gang's existence and their operations to the authorities. So William Dayton had David Hartley arrested. Isaac Hartley, David Hartley's brother, was enraged at this. So what he did was he got together with other members of the gang. They hatched a plan to um, ambush William Dayton, the guy who was investigating them, in Huddersfield and they shot him. Can you believe it? So that raised the profile of the case completely then. Charles Watson Wentworth, Marquis of Rockingham and former Prime Minister, was tasked with hunting down the killers and he had 30 of the coiners arrested by Christmas Day 1769. David Hartley was hanged at York Tyburn near York on the 28th of April 1770 and so his grave is there in the graveyard and that's why people put coins on and everything. Now so successful were the gang in the heyday they actually had an impact on the British economy because it says the dodgy enterprise caused enormous damage to the British economy. It's estimated 3.5 million pounds worth of coins, 650 million pound in today's money were, of, of counterfeit coins were paid into the Bank of England, reducing the currency's value by 9%. So they had a massive impact at the time and it was a really, really big case. Now, if you read things, I've read something that said, well, at the time, the, the, the cotton mills and the, the fulling mills where these guys worked was going into decline. There was hardship in the area. And I don't doubt for one second that that was the case. And it says they were kind of like forced into this counterfeiting. I think they would have done it anyway. I think that the, the idea of making a, a, some money would have appealed to anyone at any point. Um, and also, they were not to be messed with. They sounded like quite a nasty bunch of people. I mean, as soon as one of them was arrested, pff, they were straight out and murdered the guy investigating them. There's another story that, which is even more horrific, and I can't quite piece it together, but here's the other story. So if you read Wikipedia, it says the initial um, person that squealed on him was James Broadbent, who betrayed the gang. But... In other reports, what we've got here, and this is the horrific thing that I've read. So this other report says, the coiners overheard Dayton's informer, Abraham Ingham. And now his name doesn't crop up, hasn't cropped up before, so I'm not quite sure. But it's saying the initial informer, Abraham Ingham, where there was more than one of them, they heard, this, they heard him saying he knew who Dayton's killers were. So he's now squealing about who killed Dayton in the Union Cross Inn in Heptonstall. The gang promptly threw Ingham into the fire and put, poured burning coal down his trousers, killing him. These were, not, these were not nice people and they didn't mess about. So, very interesting story um, of crime and gangs and counterfeiting from the 1700s in uh, Yorkshire. Now, obviously, the story is bled out into popular culture. There's a children's book called Gold Pieces by Phyllis, Phyllis Bentley. And then the other one was a novel about David Hartley. Um, it was called The Gallows Pole by Ben Myers. And that won an award, the Walter Scott Prize for uh, Historical Fiction. So there you go. Fascinating story, horrendous story. Um, and we were lucky enough to see King David's grave. So if you do go to Heptonstall and you go in the graveyard, look for King David's um, gravestone. You'll, you'll recognise it by all the coins. Flick a coin on it. You never know, you might get some gold back. What do you reckon? Nice little pub. Nice, cute, yeah, nice open fire. Nice little view. Nice. So there you go, Hepton Stall, beautiful church. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, nice. Thanks, John. Yeah. As always, 
great little place. So come and visit if you can, if you can, Epson Stall. It's like another world. Thanks very much for watching. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye for now. See you